Do you think investing is easy? If your answer is no, you should watch this program once. If your answer is yes, you should watch this program at least three times. I'm David Wu, a former Wall Street strategist who has decided to make the best of Wall Street research accessible to all. In this weekly podcast, I make actionable predictions about the big story shaping the world today. If you're interested in making money, you're in the right place. If you're not, this program is designed for anyone who just wants to learn about what makes our world tick. If you find the program helpful, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. If you want to learn more, come visit us at davidwuunbound.com. Today for openers, I'd like to share some good news. Last week was as good as it gets for the credibility of David Wu Unbound. Wow, one of my long held views was finally vindicated. In the minutes of the December FOMC meeting released on Wednesday, the Federal Reserve expressed serious concerns about inflation. Fed officials were apparently so concerned that they even discussed the need to unwind their balance sheet after ending their asset purchases. What's more, according to the minutes, many participants at the meeting judged that the pace of the balance sheet runoff should be faster than at the end of previous quantitative easing programs. What is very clear is that the Federal Reserve has finally come around to my view that long-term real interest rates are too low. The market took the cue from the Fed and drove up 10-year real yields by a whopping 35 basis points in the space of just three days. This brings me to the topic of this podcast, which is about how not to lose your shirt in 2022. High real long-term interest rates will have important consequences, like volatility. Fans of growth stocks, junk bonds, and cryptocurrencies, beware. You have been warned. Just so that you know, I love volatility. There is nothing like volatility when it comes to creating real investment opportunities. But for non-professional investors, volatility can be a minefield. So how do we write out the volatility ahead? This is how I plan to structure my own portfolio. What portion of my portfolio should be sitting in stocks right now, the main building blocks of any portfolio? The stock market has become an engine of wealth creation for millions of people around the world. Over the past 30 years, the global stock market, including both developed and emerging markets, has produced an impressive annual return of 10%. And let me remind you, at 10%, your money doubles every seven years. On the flip side, these returns have not been very stable over time. For example, after averaging a 12% return a year in the 1990s, the world stock market returned on average only 6% a year in the 2000s. Over the past 10 years though, returns have recovered to about 10% a year. Unstable returns are not the only problem with owning stocks. Over the past 30 years, there were eight years during which global equity returns were negative. This means on average for every three up years, we got one down year. How do we know a down year is coming? There's usually a trigger, but it is difficult to know in advance what it is. There was, a, <coughs> there was a time when the trigger often had to do with what was going on in the US, but this is clearly changing. For example, the Eurozone debt crisis was the culprit for the fall of the global stock market in 2011. Another example is the devaluation of the Chinese RMB in 2015 that caused the market to fall in that year. If I were to ask you to guess what is the single most important driver of the world stock market, you might say it's going to be world GDP growth. This would be an intelligent guess, given that the stock market supposedly trades on expectation of future cash flows, in other words, future growth. However, your guess would be wrong. Counterintuitively, there's not much of a correlation between the world stock market returns and world GDP growth. If anything, the correlation is slightly negative. To some extent, this is because the stock market is forward-looking. It cares more about the future than about the present. Indeed, a positive relationship between global stock returns and global GDP growth does emerge when we look at the GDP growth of the subsequent years. But it is a very weak relationship, as it can only explain about 10% of the returns of the stock market. The stock market might think it has a crystal ball, but the numbers suggest otherwise. I have learned over the years that the wisdom of crowds, for which the stock market is a famous proxy, is completely, completely overrated. 
Some stocks like Tesla and Nvidia look very expensive, but is the global stock market expensive overall? Well, the 12-month forward earning yield of the global stock market is currently 5.3%, nearly the lowest level in 10 years. However, as much as 5.3% looks outright meager, it is not when we compare it with 10-year real yields at minus 0.7%. Indeed, the spread between the two, currently at 6.4%, is exactly the average for the past 10 years. What this means is that stocks are fairly valued at the current level of long-term real interest rates but not for much longer, because I think the increase in real long-term interest rates last week was just the beginning of its rise. I think 10-year real yields can go up another 75 basis points from here. If I'm right, <coughs> the global stock market may be looking at a 10% correction at a minimum. Now let's turn our attention to bonds. They used to be a good steady source of income, but these days they have come to be viewed more as a portfolio insurance. By bonds, I mean investment-grade bonds, which are safe investments destined for the portfolios of retirees, your grandfather and your grandmother. However, these boring bonds have produced a very respectable average return of 6% over the past 30 years. Amazingly, on a risk-adjusted basis, bonds have outperformed even stocks. But before I get you too excited about bonds, I've got some bad news. Bond returns have been falling. Indeed, average returns of the global bond market fell from 8% in the 90s to 5% in the 2000s to less than 4% over the past 10 years. This is because the main driver of the bond rally, global disinflation, has been losing steam even before the pandemic. For example, core inflation in the U.S. having declined from 4% to 2% in the 90s was treading water around 1.5% for much of the last 20 years until 2021. There are two sources of returns for every bond that you buy, coupons and capital gains. With trillions of dollars of European and Japanese bonds having negative coupons these days, it is not surprising that bond returns have suffered. Some people don't think this is an impediment. They said that as long as negative yields keep getting even more negative, bonds can still generate capital gains. Are they right? The problem with this argument is that negative yields kill banks. Given banks' crucial role in any capitalist economy as the intermediary between savers and borrowers, any policy that weakens the banking system is likely to do more harm than good. The experience of Japan and Europe in the past decade should be enough to persuade anyone against even trying. Modern portfolio theory says that diversification is always better than no diversification. As much as you love Tesla, your portfolio will be better off if it also has some Apple stocks. What is true about Apple is also true about bonds. In fact, it is even more true with bonds. This is because bond returns are negatively correlated with stock returns in two out of the four phases of the business cycle. This means that by including bonds in a stock only portfolio will reduce returns, but most importantly, it will reduce volatility even more. Bonds have a big problem in 2022, though. We're now entering into the mature phase of the business cycle expansion. It is typically associated with rising inflation and slowing growth. In this phase, both bonds and stocks perform poorly. This is when bonds diversification and portfolio insurance benefits are also at their weakest. I just explained why this is not the time to be loading up on bonds. And with real long-term interest rates heading higher and with the stock market having already produced three consecutive years of double-digit returns, stocks also look riskier than usual. This is where cash comes in. Yes, cash is king in the current phase of the business cycle. There was a time not so long ago that building wealth was easy. Before the global financial crisis in 2008, you could earn easily 4 to 6% by just parking your cash at the bank. Because of this, you could focus on your job without having to worry about your hard-earned money being eaten by inflation. 
It was a happier world because it was also a more equitable world. Then central banks got the big idea to push interest rates to zero or even below zero. Their intention, of course, is to get us off cash in order to drive up the demand for stocks and bonds. Central banks have succeeded beyond their wildest imagination, but they've also made us miserable in the process. Because taking responsibility for our financial future is a full-time job that is taking up more and more of our time. We have less time with our family and for our hobbies. And, be and because our mood has become a reflection of the stock market, greedy and anxious. This might be about to change because the best thing about rising inflation is that central banks will be forced to raise interest rates. I'm waiting eagerly for the day that when cash becomes once again respectable and actually profitable. Now that we have all the pieces, we can start building a proper portfolio. Any discussion about building a portfolio needs to start with the 60-40 portfolio, 60% equity and 40% bonds. This portfolio has become a bedrock for savers for a very long time. The idea is that stocks provide capital appreciation while bonds provide income and risk mitigation. The 60-40 portfolio is proof that simplicity can be a virtue. The 60-40 portfolio of global stocks and global bonds have produced an average return of 8% over the past 30 years. Not bad at all, especially considering the fact that the drawdown during a large equity correction was much smaller than obviously equity only portfolios. The simple 60-40 portfolio did so well for so many people and for so long that people decided, and rightly so, that they can manage their money better than professional investors. This is why money has been pouring out of actively managed funds into passive vehicles like exchange traded funds, ETFs. In 2021 alone, a trillion dollars flew into ETFs, bringing its total assets to $10 trillion. Unfortunately, people always chase after the returns of yesterday. In my view, the 60-40 portfolio will be seriously tested in 2022. As I said in many previous episodes of Money Game, inflation will prove to be stickier in 2022 than expected. That is, it will not go down so quickly. The news that U.S. companies are setting aside an average 3.9% of total payrolls for wage increases, the most since 2008, only strengthens my view. Without more fiscal stimulus, increased wage inflation will pressure corporate profit margins and lead to higher interest rates. This means, of course, lower stocks and lower bonds and increased volatility. This is why I've decided to launch a new mock portfolio that's designed to outperform the 60-40 portfolio. Another justification for this portfolio is that some of you, especially those of you who are financial advisors and wealth managers, have simply asked for it. We do listen to our subscribers at David Wu Unbound. Unlike the 60-40 portfolio, my mock portfolio will include cash. So I don't depart too much from the 60-40 portfolio that serves as the benchmark for many people. I will allow only a 15% deviation. In other words, allocation to stocks can vary from 45 to 75% of the portfolio, while bonds can vary from 25 to 55%. This means cash can vary from 0 to 30% of the portfolio. I will use the MSCI ACWI as my global bond, I mean stock proxy, and the Bloomberg Global Aggregate as my world bond proxy. In case you want to replicate what I'm doing, there are many ETFs linked to these two indices in different countries. There are also ETFs linked to the local version of these stocks and bond indices that may be more appropriate for you. For the coming week, my mark portfolio allocation will be 45% stocks, 25% bonds, and 30% cash. This all to signal just how strongly I feel about the outlook for both the stock and bond market in the immediate future. It is important to note that the only objective of the mock portfolio is to outperform the 60-40 portfolio. It should not be viewed as an attempt to achieve maximum absolute return. In that respect, it is very completely different from my regular stock security picks. While we are on the subject of my regular stock security picks, I'm happy to report that they're doing as well as they can be. Disney and Carnival Cruise Line, my two reopening trades, are both significantly up from my entry levels. My Exxon position has swung from a loss to a nice gain of 8%. TBF, my short U.S. Treasury position, has had a monster week up 4%. Meanwhile, I added KWEB and CNYB to my portfolio last week, as discussed in my last podcast. 
I hope you are as pleased with these results as I am. At the end of the day, investment research adds value only if it actually helps you make money. This is also the reason why I have decided to make the Honest Board permanent and cover everything we do so that you can track what we do easily. We welcome your feedback so that we can better serve you and your investment goals. Our goal is to become number one in what we do. We will appreciate your help to get us there. Thank you and talk to you next week.